Welcome everyone to the City Commissioner's Special Report. Today I've got three special guests. To my right is Vice President of Operation Unite, Dan Smoot, Kentucky State Police Captain Curtis O'Bannon, and uh, Pottville City uh, Police Chief uh, Philip Reed. I just about forgot your name looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to be talking about drug law enforcement today and I'll just start with the question that I get hit with a lot and I'm sure that you all do. Uh, someone has a drug dealer in operation in their area and uh, they tell me, they say, the police know they're there, they should be able to do something about it. And uh, what's, what's some of your comments on, on that? Do you know they're there? Uh, Commissioner, we, we're aware of some of the uh, situations that you're talking about. Uh, the way we become aware uh, obviously is by the uh, public getting involved and filing complaints with us. Um, sometimes uh, the complaints need to go a step farther as far as the person who knows what's going on may need to come in, sit down and be a potential witness for us to be able to build a case to where we can take action and uh, follow up on the investigation and actually be able to pursue charges, we actually need steps falling into place to, uh, to be able to could, to work on that. Well, what kind of cooperation do you need from the public, Dan? You, you well, don't have a tip line, and uh, what is the, the tip line number? I'll have to get it off my, I don't have it okay. memorized, but uh, I'll, I'll get it for you. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the, the police are somewhat uh, behind the eight ball. Uh, we know that there's a lot of traffic and we suspect there's drug dealing. I wished we could go up there and kick the door down and take the drugs and take them to jail, but it's not that easy. Uh, we need people to assist us to make a buy out of the house. Let us use their name on an affidavit to obtain a search warrant. There's just many steps procedurally that have to be met before legally we can enter a home and do something with uh, the alleged dealer. What about you, Curtis? Do you get many of those calls? Or? We do. We get complaints all the time. Um, I would say every shift that uh, we have somebody dispatching, they'll receive a call about uh, a tip about a uh, someone who's dealing drugs. Um, the the problem we run into is is building the case. That's the critical component. Um, our clearance rate is uh, ninety six percent in two thousand twelve on on drug arrests, and that's a that's a high clearance rate. But to achieve that we have to go through the steps procedurally to build those cases and and uh, someone just calling and saying hey I've got a drug dealer that lives down the street uh, that that does not build the case for us we've got to have someone who can get in and make a buy uh, someone who's willing to sign an affidavit uh, to start that process well somebody that that would be interested in stepping up and and doing something about that what are some of the things that that they would need to do what is some of the information that would be uh, valuable to you in order for you to start the process of investigating a, a drug dealer in a community? Well, a lot of times when people call in, the only thing they will tell us is, hey, uh, they'll give us a name, where they live at, they're dealing drugs. Uh, information that would be helpful to us is, um, you know, tag numbers, uh, names of people that are involved, uh, the, the volume of traffic that's coming in and out of the residence, uh, what is it that you see, uh, what is it that makes you think that they're they're dealing drugs. Uh, sometimes it's not actually a drug dealer. There, there might be some other legal justification or reason for that someone has a higher volume of traffic in and out of their residence. But we need that kind of information and to gather that information to start building uh, building a case. Okay. Well, now since House Bill One went in effect, what what emerging trends have you seen in the in the, the drug traffic? Uh, and not only House Bill 1, but what are some emergency, emerging trends in, in drug traffic that you've seen? Uh, Commissioner, for some of our things that we've seen, um, obviously we still see the controlled substance abuse, um, the prescription uh, abuse. Um, so some of the complaints that uh, we've seen recently are, are minor shoplifting cases that have, have escalated into a larger scale investigation due to a controlled substance being involved. Uh, there, we've also had a uh, recent case of, of a shoplifter that uh, once the arrest was made, that individual was attempting to uh, to uh, consume a large amount of the controlled substance to hide it and to keep from being charged with it. Uh, 
in the, in that arrest, uh, the officer actually had to deploy the, ta the taser, so it escalated the use of force that the officer had to use uh, just based on a minor shoplifting charge. Uh, so uh, the controlled substance escalated uh, the, the force there, uh, created a larger scale investigation b because of drug abuse. Uh, we've also seen some other cases where uh, small children have been involved. Uh, we've had to actually had to call social services to come in and take kids from homes because uh, the parents or their caretaker being uh, so involved in the uh, abuse of the controlled substance. With the, with the confrontation involved in these cases, how dangerous is that for the police officer? Well, I think uh, anytime you escalate, an officer has to escalate to use any type of force, uh, I think that the danger associated with that rises dramatically. And um, you know, officers are trained to respond to what they are perceiving as um, as either a resisting to, to their commands or you know to some type of force. And uh, based on that training, uh, and granted, we are light years ahead of where we were 20 years ago in law enforcement with that. But uh, still, anytime you 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 have to escalate that force, the danger and the uh, chance of injury for the person being arrested, a bystander or the officer, greatly increases. Well, Dan. Uh you're up on this. Uh, since House Bill 1 has passed, uh, what, what about our drug use? We've had double-digit decreases uh, in the amount of, especially uh, your Schedule 3s, uh, hydrocodone and, uh, and the likes. We've had double-digit decreases uh, in the amounts of these prescriptions that are being written. I think House Bill 1 was a wonderful piece of legislation. Uh, it took that needed step uh, to guard pain management centers. You now have to, uh, uh, you have to be a certified pain management doctor. You have to own and spend the majority of your time at your practice. And uh, what we're trying to do are regulate those clinics that uh, push out high volumes of controlled substances, which pain management centers do. We learned from Florida uh, back, everybody's heard of the Florida pill pipeline. Yeah. Uh, many cases in the Florida investigations where you had a gynecologist or a uh, some doctor in a field that had absolutely nothing to do with pain management. The only thing they would do would write prescriptions all day long. And that's where, uh, I think that's where we got our early education. And, and Kentucky took heed. They passed a really good, effective piece of legislation. And I think in the coming years, you'll see our uh, uh, controlled substances uh, reduce even more because of that piece of legislation. Well, now with the reduction of controlled substances in the uh in the eastern Kentucky when as that progresses what can we look to see happen then as uh, either one of you know. I think there's no question that the next drugs heroin uh, it's all around us it's long been stalled in northern Kentucky and just last month in northern Kentucky and Louisville uh, heroin overdoses exceeded uh, pill overdoses in, in those two locations well now how, how hard is it uh, well, how hard is it now to uh, get an investigation started? I mean, uh, what does an officer have to do to, to start an investigation on somebody dealing drugs? Well, I think you have to have some type of complaint. You have to have some type of suspicion that there's legal activity uh, taking place. Uh, I, I can give you uh, a recent example. It touches on some of the emerging trends that we're seeing, um, yeah, bath salts. Yeah. Uh, people still uh, still are ordering those now. The 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 law that went into effect in 2011 prohibited trafficking in those and distributing those. Uh, but we still have internet companies that are providing those. Uh, we get large mail order shipments in, and uh, the price of uh, of a gram of of bath salts is is pretty steep. Yeah. And uh, uh, what we're seeing is people ordering it and then they're selling it because they can turn a profit on it. And anytime you you've got something, uh, a tool like the internet that makes it so easy to go out there and and uh, you know get information or to get something that that is used as a as an illegal substance to to alter your mind or your body, uh, you're going to see problems. And so, the, but the, to answer your question, the first step is always you've got to have a complaint, some type of suspicion uh, that there's some type of criminal activity related to drugs involved. Well, what about the uh, synthetic marijuana that? Uh, that I've heard some talk about that you can buy in the 
shops and supposed to be legally. Is there anything in the works on stopping that sale? Or I'll let Dan talk about that. He that that was covered under the bath salts also. Uh, uh, basically, synthetic marijuana is nothing but a green leafy substance with chemicals sprayed on it. Uh, it's one of the most dangerous substances out there. You never know what you're getting. It's never the same. And uh, that law was also passed when the bath salts law was passed. Another good piece of legislation, we've seen a, a, a large, large reduction getting them out of the head shops and the uh, Ma and Paul gas stations. But as uh, the captain alluded to, there is still some internet problems and some other things we need to shore up. Okay. Well, now, marijuana. How big a problem is that in, in Pike County and Floyd County? Well, in, uh, during 2012, from July 1st through December 31st, six-month time span, uh, the state police alone uh, confiscated or seized 19.2 million in Ill illegal drugs. By far and away, the majority of that was marijuana plants. So uh, it's still a very prevalent problem in eastern Kentucky, specifically in Pike County. Uh, and it has been for years. I don't know what the statistics going back to where the, the rise started to occur here, but it's here and, uh, you know, there's some, some recent legislation. I know that Dan's been involved in some, uh, some discussions at the state level uh, about legislation to, uh, to legalize marijuana uh, or industrial hemp. Yeah. Well, now, how hard will it be now if the, if the hemp bill passes? How hard will it be then to distinguish a, a marijuana crop from a hemp crop? I, I can pro and there's been so much uh, information put out on hemp, Barry, but, but I'm going to uh, promise you that, that the fact of the matter is there's only one way to distinguish between a marijuana plant and a hemp plant, and that is through the use of a gas chromatograph that only the Kentucky State Police have. There is no visual way to tell the difference between those two plants. They would like you to believe that, that hemp is a safe product and that we can make millions of dollars and put all Kentucky farmers back to work. But that just frankly isn't the case. There's no market for industrial hemp. The countries, Canada, Europe, Germany, the countries that have uh, legalized industrial hemp, every one of these countries are now having to subsidize the farmers, the processing plants, uh, and so on and so forth. The reason is everything hemp can do, there's a cheaper raw material out there that can not only uh, make it better or less expensive, but it's a better product. Hemp is a novelty item. The only people that, buy, you know, they'll buy their brother-in-law a hemp t-shirt or a, a hemp bar of soap. And the pro people think, well, hemp isn't marijuana. It's exactly marijuana. The only difference is that it has a lower THC content, which is what makes you high. You can get high off a hemp plant. You just have to smoke more of the hemp than you would the marijuana. Uh, hemp is a bad idea for Kentucky. Uh, there's eight other states that have passed the hemp law. The first plant has not been grown because it's against federal law. The federal government sees hemp and marijuana as it is, which is the exact same plant. Well, now, uh, it's been said that Mitch McConnell uh, supported this bill, but there was a, there was a, uh, uh, a condition, wasn't it? Senator McConnell has long supported the state police governor marijuana strike force. Uh, he, he's always been a big advocate of that program. And if you read his endorsement for industrial hemp, he, like everybody else, wants Kentuckians back to work. But at the end, he said, but if it would in any way affect the eradication of marijuana in Kentucky, he wouldn't be for it. Well, the Kentucky State Police has went on, uh, went on record on the KET Tonight uh, show and said it would drastically affect the eradication effort. There is no way visually uh, from one foot and especially from 500 feet in helicopters to tell the difference between the two plants. So this would, this would just open up a, a statewide market for illegal marijuana then? As, as well, what this... and, and they say, we'll do GPS coordinates, and that way law enforcement will know where it is. Well, they, they do GPS coordinates on corn crops too, the agriculture uh, department. But what's in the middle of those corn crops? Marijuana. Yeah. Marijuana. Uh, another thing, years and years ago when, when meth was big in western Kentucky, the farmers could not 
keep the thieves from stealing anhydrous out of the tanks. It was a huge farm problem, especially in western Kentucky. Now I promise you, if a farmer plants marijuana in his fields, when he does his budget, he better account for armed guards because night and day they will be stealing those hemp plants. A, they can mix it with their regular marijuana to make more product, and B, you can smoke it and get high off of it. Let's talk about drug overdose for a minute. Uh, I understand it's on the rise. Uh, how, how many more overdoses have we had in eastern Kentucky? Does that, has anybody had a number on that? Uh, I don't have the uh, statistics for 2012. Um, I can tell you that we received 100 overdose complaints that initially came in as, a, as an overdose complaint or was later changed to an overdose complaint. Um, that number probably varies, the true number probably varies. Uh, in 2011 in Pike County there were 35 deaths uh, due to overdose that were attributed to overdose. Uh, in Floyd County there were 38. Uh, in 2011, and uh, w when you compare that to the uh, the fatality rate on on traffic collisions, uh, that's scary because uh, we don't have that many traffic related collision fatalities in the county. So our, we've essentially doubled. We've got the double the, in Pike County. You've got double the number of deaths due to overdose versus traffic collisions, which is a statewide trend. I, I think. Uh, I I think last year was the first year ever we had more drug overdoses in the state of Kentucky than, than we did uh, traffic fatalities. Oh my. And, uh, well, kind of get an idea, how many, how many 911 calls does uh, Post 9 get a year? Uh, in 2012, they received over 150,000 911 calls. How many does Pablo? Uh, the, the CAD system received 9,500 calls. Uh, last year total, I'm, I'm not sure the difference between not actual 911 calls and actual just regular call-ins. Well, now how many how many uh, how many officers do you have uh, to cover those calls? 9,500, few 14. We we have 18 officers in the city. Yeah, and how many? How many we we have 59 sworn uh, troopers at post, including supervisors, detectives, and road units. Yeah, so you're you're pretty well swamped with what. What calls you get? Um, from the state police perspective, uh, Pikeville Post is the busiest post in the state. Uh, that's in terms of calls for service, uh, the complaints, uh, criminal case investigations. Uh, it, it runs the gamut. Uh, domestic related calls, uh, complaints, uh, it's the busiest post. And then when you average that out per trooper, uh, per trooper it's busier at, at Pikeville Post than and Pike and Floyd counties are the two busiest counties we have. Do we, uh, are there very many injuries? Uh, uh, it's kind of similar to the question I asked earlier, but uh, how many officers do we have that, that actually get injured on the job? Uh, maybe going to not necessarily a, a, a something to do with drugs, but maybe a domestic issue or uh, uh, in a high speed chase or something like that. Uh, Barry, our, our numbers are, are kind of low in that aspect, but. Uh, for instance, the the case we was talking about earlier, when the the level of force arose, that's when officers uh, have a more probable chance of of receiving injury. Um, but our our numbers are pretty low, and just uh, what you're what you're asking there. Well, you know the the which I've I've ridden with with our many of our officers, and uh, you know the. Uh, calls that we went on, we've gone on domestic calls. We even went on a call one night uh, where uh, a guy was fleeing from an officer and uh, he'd actually managed to tackle him at one point, but the guy still got away. And, uh, you know, uh, when uh, the officer looked over at me and said, I, I've got to go to him, and, you know, away we went. And, and, uh, but uh, the fear was that he may have got hurt. Right. And uh, something might have happened, but uh, you know, thankfully that when we got there, the officer was all right. And uh, but it is a very dangerous, dangerous job, uh, you know. And I, I admire the men, young men that enter enter the police or service as a policeman, because you know you really, I guess it really has to be a calling more so than a job, because you don't make that much money, and uh, the danger that you're going to face every day, man, uh, it's tremendous. The, uh, 
post nine, we we drove nearly two million miles last year during 2012, and uh, if you take that into account, and you start thinking about that. That's that's a lot of miles, yeah. and uh, we have officers that are involved in traffic collisions, um, some more serious than others, and. Unfortunately, the trend in law enforcement has been, you've seen a, a rise in, um, in the number of deaths related to traffic collisions versus the number of, uh, of any, well, any other in the line of duty death. And so being on the road traveling is, is, is extremely dangerous. Uh, but when you look at the statistics related to drugs and crime, and, and it's over 90% of all crime is related to either drug and or alcohol. And uh, that's pretty alarming. Yes, you know? it is. Very alarming. Well, now, uh, well, there's been some new legislation, not only House Bill Lump 1, but uh, wasn't there a, a federal legislation, legislation uh, Dan, about uh, uh, <clears throat> if uh, a drug dealer were to sell uh, someone pills and they overdose on those pills, isn't there a national murder charge now? Well, there's a, what it is, it, it's an enhancement that they put on a, uh, a, a trafficking of controlled substances. And you are correct, that enhancement simply states that if you sell someone uh, illegal drugs and as a result of taking those drugs they die, that you can be charged with murder. And uh, just recently in, in Lee County, uh, we, we used that charge and uh, the, the Miss McIntosh pled guilty in the U.S. Federal Court in London to uh, the enhancement of murder uh, during the distribution of controlled substances. I believe it's a wonderful tool. Yeah. Uh, I think those selling the drugs need to be held responsible. Uh, and a lot of the things that, that are in place now don't hold them responsible to that level. But I promise you we're going to look at every overdose case differently in the future. Uh, and we're going to uh, try to find out who supplied the drugs, where the drugs came from, and we're going to try to get federal murder charges put on these people. So that's, you're, you're probably starting a, a different way of investigation. Uh, it'll start at the coroner's office and then go back? Well, the U.S. Attorney has an initiative, uh, and he believes that, that this charge and these cases can make a huge difference, and, and I think we in law enforcement agree with him. And the first thing we'll have to do is educate our coroners that these overdose uh, scenes need to be treated as murder scenes. And of course, we need to educate our officers too. These aren't strictly accidental overdoses. Somebody caused this death by providing uh, the controlled substance. Well, what about the family? If the family doesn't want this known that this was a drug overdose and they, they asked that this, this be uh, something else? Well, that's a problem for us. I mean, that basically closes the door uh, on, uh, on finding out who's responsible for their loved one's death. Uh, and you know, it's uh, years ago, it was really embarrassing to admit that someone in your family had a drug problem. <clears throat> I don't know any family that somebody doesn't have a drug problem. And I think it's going to take all of us uh, educating and treating. You know, it's long been looked to law enforcement to do something about uh, uh, the drug problem and we can arrest and arrest and arrest. And we did it for 60 years, but we are not gonna arrest our way out of this problem. It's gonna take communities, education, treatment, people working together. Uh, we just need to bring everybody to the table and like the new federal law, we need to find different ways to attack this because a lot of the things we've been doing in the past just quite frankly are not working. Well, uh, now, Dan, how many how many people have been arrested for dealing drugs since Operation started in two thousand? Operation Unite started in two thousand three. I guess most people know why Unite was formed. Uh, Congressman Rogers uh, read the Lexington Herald Leader expose uh, of painkiller capital of the world, and uh, he, like the rest of us, were surprised that that it was actually that bad. Now that was ten years ago. So when we were formed, our mission, which it still is today, is the street level drug dealer. And then of course, the voucher program and, and the community education. We've arrested well over 4,000 street level drug dealers. But more importantly, we've had 1,500 people successfully complete a long term treatment. And uh, uh, as I said, treatment is a key. I, I've been doing this for 32 years and I've never met a for-profit drug dealer. 
Everybody I've ever arrested for dealing drugs were selling drugs to fuel their addiction. Now, where law enforcement comes in is we put them on rock bottom. When we arrest them, most of them finally for the first time will realize I need to get help. Yeah. And there's choices out there now. We have wonderful drug courts, we have the Unite treatment vouchers, uh, we have a lot of churches that have stepped up and they're doing uh, uh, faith-based aftercare. Uh, there's help out there. If anybody says, I just can't get help, uh, they need to keep searching because the communities of East Kentucky are stepping up and providing help to these people. You know, I'm, I've actually witnessed, you know, some of our arrests that the, the, the guy getting arrested actually thanked the officer for arresting him. And, uh, you know, when I used to do the uh, Lifeline groups uh, time and time again, and probably the thing I heard most was when I was arrested and I was in jail, I realized I needed help. So, you know, it's, uh, it has made, we have made some progress. And uh, uh, with, with uh, well, with prescription drugs, maybe hopefully on the wane, and you said we'll see heroin. How much harder, harder will it be to investigate heroin over, over prescription drugs? Well, I think uh, investigating any illicit narcotic is easier than, than uh, say, for example, pain pain pills, uh, because uh, and we talked about this earlier, and Dan made the point. You know, it's easier to say you can't have this because the law says you cannot have this, versus you can have this because your name is on a bottle, and and you can do with that as you please. Um, so, as f from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, when you start looking at street level cases, those cases are made through traffic stops, complaints, uh, intelligence that's gathered from the community, people calling in. When you start getting into targeting larger, uh, more in depth, more complicated um, drug operations, and you get into that aspect, those, those investigations take a lot of time. They take months and years of hard work, of a lot of, uh, a lot of strategizing on the part of the officer. I've been involved in those conversations and I, I know Philip and Dan have too, just where you're sitting around thinking of a way, you know, an angle to get in to that drug dealer. Um, and that is tough to do. But when you have someone who's willing to say, listen, yeah, I want to make a difference, I want to help, and they're willing to, you know, make a buy or they're willing to say, yes, I witnessed this and, and sign their name to an affidavit, those people make a difference because that gives us the leverage we need to be able to move forward and, and actually get inside that, that house or that, um, that building, that structure to, to search for those drugs. And, and so those cases, they vary in complexity. And uh, the reality is for law enforcement, uh, you know, we'll have one today and you'll have another one tomorrow. Uh, they, they never seem to end. Well, now, you know, uh, it's been in the news uh, over the years, you know how that uh, different government agencies don't work together, the CIA and the FBI and all that, but how do, how do you all work together? Barry, uh, we, ha we have an officer that uh, works on the FBI task force, and I know he, he does specifically drug investigation. He works uh, with United officials as well as Kentucky State Police officials and the FBI in our area. Um, but our, our officers, you know, what, what he was talking about a minute ago, uh, the heroin being a bigger uh, issue, everything is, is connected in a, in a fashion that if, if we have a problem in the city, more than likely it's going to expand into Pike County as well as across the state. Therefore, working together with with these guys unite that that's going to be the whole key in being having success in the end uh, reaching the main goal is being able to work together um, w we have we worked well together with everyone uh, we had some cases where uh, some drugs were being uh, brought into the jail on several different instances where uh, the jailer Rodney Scott stepped up uh, notified us what was going on we was able to work together with the state police and uh, was able to find out what was going on, complete a c case investigation on it, make an arrest, and, and solve the problem. But was only able to do that by an initial complaint, letting each other know what's going on, and formulating uh, the case investigation and, and seeing through it to the end and working together. Well, now, Dan, how do you work with the KSP and, and 
Like well, obviously, uh, I, I retired from the state police. That They're my first love, so to speak, and uh, I, I believe that the state police is, is the premier law enforcement agency in the nation. Well, uh, I think, I think. Uh, but it, well, <laughs> 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 and, and I think the days of, uh, of departments being territorial, you know, this is my turf, I think they're long gone. Uh, uh, and I believe that we, we've all come to realize that uh, we have to pull resources to make a difference. I've got two guys on the DEA task force, one on the Appalachia Haida task force, as well as the rest of our detectives that focus on street level cases. And the reason, for the same reason Chief Reed put his on the DEA task force, that just combines us all together. And KSP has long had members on the federal task forces, the state task forces, and, and I just think, uh, I think things are really uh, going well in law enforcement. It's just, it's an overwhelming problem. Uh, we always need more resources. We lose guys to retirement. Uh, and uh, being in the field of narcotics isn't as sexy as it used to be. Yeah. Now it's cleaning up meth labs and uh, all the new problems that, that, are, that are coming uh, on the scene. And as uh, Captain O'Bannon said, the federal investigations, why make a huge impact uh, on small communities Sometimes they take years. Uh, reason being is, you know, heroin is is not being made in Detroit. It's being shipped from Detroit to here. But then you got the Mexican connections, the Colombian connections, and, and all the different problems uh, that come with federal cases. But I think we have wonderful city, state, and federal partners, and I think we're all working together uh, for the same goal. What well, was an example of you? working a case together is a, is a recent case where you did something together and uh, I know of one case uh, over here on, uh, uh, I forget the name of the street, but uh, there was a uh, city, city officers and a unite officer were involved in that drug bust. Is there a situation where that unite and uh, KSP unite and uh, the most recent that, that I can recall, and it's not uh, here in the city of Pikeville, but in McGolfin County, the Harlow back case. Uh, Harlow was probably, uh, I'm going to say, a notorious drug dealer. Uh, I'd heard of him 15 years ago when I was active in, with state police. Uh, we had the sheriff's department, the city police department, the state police, Unite, and the DEA worked on that case for six months. And that case involved pills coming from Florida. Uh, Mr. Back was organizing large groups of people to go to Florida, bring the pills back, and sell them here in Floyd, McGoffin, and Pike counties. Uh, all the departments came together, and uh, just last week uh, he was found guilty on all 12 counts in the U.S. District Court. And uh, uh, due to his age, frankly, Mr. Back will die in prison because the efforts of uh, six different departments coming together. Uh, that's good. good. Good to know that, I'll tell you. Uh, what about the education aspect? What uh, what kind of drug education do, does each department uh, supply the community? Well, education is a is a very important uh, tool in the whole aspect of this problem. Um, our agency, for example, has what is it, the Dare program, uh, where we had an officer trained through uh, the Drug Abuse Resistance Education program, where he's certified to go into the school system, where the school system actually sets in their curriculum. Um, through the second, fifth, and seventh grade levels uh, uh, through the DARE program where they're uh, educated on uh, different types of drugs, uh, their effects, and what they need to be aware of in the home, and, uh, and also the steps if they do see it, what they need to do. Um, but there's other, other programs that we have too, uh, working with the state police. We uh, Community involvement, uh, just this past weekend we had a, a, a kids expo uh, both agencies were together over there. There were also uh, education materials ha passed out to children uh, to educate them on um, uh, the harmful side effects uh, of drugs as well as uh, what they need to be aware of in their own home uh, and what the what steps they need to take uh, to, to talk to a teacher or a police officer or anyone that they are confident in if, if they do see these things. Uh, the state police is, uh, we've got uh, our public affairs officer does a variety of programs. Uh, goes into schools, sp speaks at uh, churches, uh, community events. Uh, there's a there's a variety of different education components to it. Um, one of the keys I think 
with the education part of it is the part that Unite brought to the table, which was the treatment, which we had not we had not had a that component involved in it, and I, I think that's critical. And and over 1,500 people com successfully completing a treatment program, that is people that you don't have coming back as a repeat yeah. offender. And uh, you know if you're actually doing taking steps that are eliminating that part of it, I think that uh, that that's a win with it. Well, Barry, as you know, uh, education is the third component to the Unite uh, three-prong approach. Uh, we have the Unite clubs in schools. We have the Shoot Hoops, Not Drugs. Uh, we have the Hooked on Fishing, Not on Drugs. Uh, we have our annual uh, Camp Unite that the state police helps us with, and hopefully someday we can get uh, Pikeville PD up. Uh, we take kids from all over the region for a week to the University of the Cumberlands, and for that week, uh, we just flood them with uh, mentoring, good choices, drug education, uh, and of course, we believe that the community coalitions, which Pikeville probably has the top Unite coalition around, uh, we believe that that's another real key component. And I would like to announce that the Unite coalition purchased a uh, medicine drop box, which we're going to be bringing to the Pikeville Police Department in the next two weeks. And uh, we've long known that most people that get started on drugs do so out of their uh, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, medicine cabinets. So if you have old or unused medication in the city of Pikeville, uh, after next week you'll be able to bring it to the Pikeville City Police Department to dispose of it safely. And uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward to that partnership. Wow. Uh, how, you said that most, most kids get started out of their parents or grandparents' medicine cabinet. Uh, how, what's the youngest you've seen someone addicted to drugs? Well, well Barry, the youngest I, they started. I, mean. I know we've talked about a lot of <coughs> alarming figures, the overdose rates and the, the <coughs> calls for service. But if, if you watch this program and leave with nothing else, know that the average age of first use in Appalachia, in, in East Kentucky, is age 11. Now, what we have done is we have robbed our children of their, of yeah. their childhood. Uh, I didn't get exposed to illegal drugs till I was in college. Uh, now we have people as young as eight and nine years old experimenting with illegal drugs. Uh, and, and that is the shame uh, of, of this epidemic more than anything, is what we did to these kids. That's why the education, which we've all band together to do, is so vitally important. Uh, it, it, it's, it's time to make uh, being drug free cool. Uh, we got to get back to that and uh, we're only going to do it through education and treatment and I promise you that law enforcement is going to continue to arrest and, and, uh, and we're not going to tolerate uh, drug trafficking in our communities. Well, you know, talking about uh, kids starting at a young age, you know, until uh, juvenile drug court funding was cut off and I did the groups for juvenile drug court. and. Uh, I remember one of my one of my participants uh, told me about the day that he was ten years old. His father sitting on the couch with him, rolling a joint, and them smoking it together. That was his first introduction to drugs. And I, you know, as he as he sat there and told me that, you know, I I, I almost cried. What an impact that was on that child. And uh, you know how how much of that are we seeing? Well, too much. But but as we talk and 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 it all appears negative. Here's what I, w I want people to know. Uh, fortunately, through my job, I get to travel to other places: uh, West Virginia, Virginia, other states. Uh, they don't have a unite. They don't have the uh, FBI and Hida drug task forces. Uh, we are the only place in the United States of America that if you can't afford treatment, uh, we'll pay for it. And that's here in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, we have one of the most professional groups of, uh, of law enforcement in the country. And I think we're all on the same mission. And if anybody says, I can't get help, I need off drugs, there is help. And we can get you off drugs. And that's what we're banding together to do. Well, I just are other areas in the country looking to us to see what we are doing? To, yeah. there, there's no question. Here in East Kentucky, uh, we're leading the way. Uh, and I know that uh, each year, or for the second year in a row, we're having the, the National 
prescription drug conference in Florida again this year. Uh, Congressman Rogers uh, is the co-founder of the Congressional Drug Caucus and what we're trying to do is make the drug problem a national problem and I know if you watch the presidential debates uh, which I watched them close and I kept waiting to hear the substance abuse and drug problems of America but you never hear it. This is a national problem yeah. that needs national attention and, and, and that's what we're trying to do at Unite is put it on the national level but also highlight what we're doing here in East Kentucky because we believe through law enforcement, treatment, and education, we believe that we're going to turn the tide and get back on the right track. Well, now, for all of our efforts, have we, have we had improvement in, in uh, our war on drugs? I know that here in the city we, we've, we don't see things like we used to. Uh, seem like things are getting addressed pretty quick. And, uh, what, what about you? What, what, are, what are some of these improvements that we Well, uh, it's kind of hard to, to put on a statistical level, but you can see changes uh, for improvements. Uh, for prov improvements have been made, you can see positive changes. Um, and, and again, that's uh, where the, the agencies have worked together and worked closely with, uh, with the court system and the judges in these, in these programs uh, that these people that we do arrest uh, when they complete the programs uh, you know, sometimes we do see the people come out and, and they do have a different outlook on life. So I look at that as a, as a positive change in our community. They come out, they, they're productive, and like you said, they do stop and see us and, and shake our hands and, and thank us for arresting them because that, that may be the eye-opening experience that they need to get their life back on the right track. So, sometimes it, it doesn't happen that way, but if we have one out of ten, that, that's, that's a positive change, in my opinion, for our community. Uh, why, why not strive to make it two out of ten and keep striving forward to to get to where we can get it ten out of ten? Yeah. That, that's what we're that's what we're working for is to is to see it a hundred percent. But you know the, the one or two now is, is what we want because it is a positive change for our community. And Barry, if 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 you get down and and you really need uplifted, go to a drug court graduation. Yeah. And watch thirty or forty young men uh, that were at their lowest become tax paying citizens because that's what we want. You all have uh, one of the most impressive uh, treatment facilities in the state right here in Pike County. Uh, ask for a tour of West Care. Yeah. There's 70 or 80 young men in there getting their future back on track. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of positive things going on in this region. Well, you know, and actually that, that jail West Care program is pr probably one of the more successful rehab programs anywhere. Uh, and, and very well run. And, uh, I know some of the people that work up there, and it it's, uh, does a tremendous job. What improvements have you seen, Curtis? Well, I think, uh, I think when you talk about one life change, we call that a win. And the, the reality is there's still, there's still a problem with, with drugs, and it's not just one specific type. As we talked about, you know, heroin has started to make a comeback. Um, some other things that, uh, some emerging trends that we didn't see five, ten years ago, uh, like Dilaudid, it's it's a it's a narcotic that's used by anesthesia profess yeah. professionals. Um, I mean, we're talking about something that's a really hardcore. You, we we're seeing little pockets of, of that, not necessarily in Pike County, but but in the state. Um, that's one of the emerging trends. The the bath salts. We we had a win with the legislation, but you know the internet's caused a little bit of a of an issue, and it's um, people circumventing the the process, if you will, <clears throat> to try to still to still get that and and the. The, the issue I think we have began to address with legislation, um, I think the legislation helps the, uh, the national monitoring effort, and Dan knows more about that than I do. I think that will be another uh, something that would give us uh, some leverage to be able to fight the problem with that at a higher level. Uh, I think we see the wins and we have to celebrate those. You know, we have to celebrate those, but uh, the reality is still there, there are drugs that are going up and down the highways. Uh, that are in homes that are being abused that are uh, not necessarily needed but you know they're they're used for an abuse purpose. Well Captain O'Bannon hit on a, on a great point if you look at all of the uh, important pertinent drug legislation that's been introduced in Frankfurt it's been by East Kentucky uh, yeah. legislators yeah. Uh, they like us have band together because they quite frankly have had enough also and uh, Congressman Rogers is working on the National Prescription Monitoring Program and what we're trying to do is link all 50 states together 
just like our Casper tells us when you go to doctors in Kentucky. Uh, we want to know if you went to a doctor in Florida or if you went to a doctor in Ohio. So that's something that's on the national level that will become a reality someday. Uh, but as Captain O'Bannon said, trends are trends. The drugs will change. Uh, the bottom line is, if you have a drug problem, we can get you treatment. And the other bottom line is, we, law enforcement, are going to continue to work together to find people selling drugs and arrest them. Well, now, Chief, other than the raise and pay, what would be on your wish list? Obviously. And I'll ask each one of you that question. Obviously, more, more officers uh, in our department is, is much needed right now. We're actually in the process of, of filling some of those spots that we have vacant. Uh, and, and with that, that's, uh, you know, I'd like to get another officer that's certified in the DARE program. Uh, we have two two independent school systems in the in our community that, you know, I'd like to have an officer in both of the schools uh, for education purposes, not only for the safety in the school, but, you know, for drug education. Um, uh, more, the more we can provide to our community as far as people, you know, the better off we'll be for a positive outcome. Uh, at Post right now, currently, we're trying to identify two, uh, two new street level detectives who will focus on street level narcotics investigations. Uh, they'll work closely with Unite, with our drug enforcement section, uh, with, with the pipe officers that, are, that do narcotics. Uh, that's something that we're uh, actually in the process. We did interviews last week for that. Uh, so we're in the uh, process of identifying two officers to do strictly that. Um, some of the things that we want um, that we want to see in the community. We want to see the community um, start to come around a couple of different issues that we're battling with. The drug issue is huge. Um, that's a collaborative effort. You get a synergistic effect when you start putting multiple different agencies. You start pulling the community in, different organizations to, to come on board and help with those type problems. I think you start to see results and I think Unite's a testament to that. Um, uh, it's a different note, but traffic fatalities. Pike County's ranked uh, number two and number three the last few years in the weighted fatality scale. And what that means is we don't necessarily have the most people dying in traffic collisions, although it is high for Pike County. Um, we have the m more people dying who are unbelted or intoxicated or on drugs yeah. um, in traffic related fatalities. We just, just had one in Floyd County here in, in the last couple weeks. Uh, that is something that we want to see. We want to see Pike County come out of the top five in the weighted fatality scale. Uh, so those are two huge endeavors for us and, and see drugs is tied to that because you know alcohol and drugs are related to um, you know the weighted fatality scale. Well my big two wishes is uh, one is for more community members to get involved and you have an avenue to do that. Yeah. Uh, I know Barry you all meet monthly uh, and there's a lot of things you do at the Unite Coalition uh, that are focused on educating the youth. And I want more people to come out and get involved because the more people that get involved, the better chance we have of coming out. And secondly, if you have a drug problem, you can call 1-866-90-UNITE. Uh, we have certified alcohol and drug counselors. Uh, they'll talk to you about your problem. They will get you into treatment. There's help out there and uh, it's one phone call away. Well now, uh, real quick, uh, are you, do you have enough people? Or is, it, <laughs> is, there, any, is there any such thing as enough people? If, if you talk to a uh, head of any law enforcement agency in this country and they tell you they have enough people, <laughs> I want to meet them. Uh, well, I was hoping I'd get that answer. <laughs> yeah. I do think the chief needs a raise though. We talked about that earlier. Well, Oh, well, I thank each one of you for spending this hour with me. Thank and, you very much. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you.